Okay, so just to let everybody know, hey, we're live. <laughs> uh, James is here. We're having some uh, audio problems. Uh, hopefully you can hear. Um, if you cannot hear my voice, if somebody can put something in the chat, let me know if uh, things are good. James can hear me. I cannot. Sorry, I can hear James. He cannot hear me. So if you can't hear me, let's see. Let me put this in the chat. Okay, good. Thank you, Sean. All right. So James is going to log back on. We're going to try this again. Uh, obviously, an issue on his end. I, I will say um, 14 hours ahead in Sydney, Australia. I'm still impressed that technology is going to work this well, that we can still connect half, literally halfway across the world. Um, so while he's trying to reconnect, I want to go ahead and say welcome to Studio HFL and uh, live with, eventually, uh, James Morrison. And before he gets here, let me go ahead and just say thank you to Trent Austin and Austin Custom Brass for their generous sponsorship of this month's interviews and last month. In fact, this month has been incredible. We've had uh, Rachel Samoya, uh, well, it used to be Rachel Rodriguez, that was a lot easier to say, Jen Murata, Sarah Stonebeck, tonight, of course, James Morrison, and next week, Chris Coletti. Uh, what a great lineup this is for June. Uh, I'll be releasing the July Live With interviews very soon. But uh, again, thanks to Austin Custom Brass. You can always find out more at austincustombrass.biz. That's .biz. And let's see. Yeah, so I'm still going to plug these shirts. The World Trumpet Force, the WTF, established 2020. Uh, Ventilabis Magis, of course, means push harder. And uh, again, what a great motto for the trumpet community. Um, okay, it looks like James is trying to get back on here. Let me put him in. I can hear him. He can hear me now. Terrific. Terrific. I'm going to switch sides. I'm just. That's great. That's great. We're almost there. We're almost there. Hello. Hello. <laughs> it's nice I to meet a, you. I look a bit lit overhead, but anyway, whatever, we're here. <laughs> yeah, we're here, finally. I, you know, I went ahead, went live, and just letting people know, of course, we are 14 hours apart, you know, literally halfway across the world, and we're able to yes, meet like are. this. How, how cool is that? Very. It's very cool. Um, you know, uh, I always feel so privileged to for every one of my guests. And uh, I was talking to a friend of mine earlier today, and I said, you know, I kind of feel a little bit starstruck talking to James <laughs> Morrison. You know, not it's, <laughs> oh, no, truthfully, you know, I mean, it's it's not just that you're a fantastic uh, trumpet player, Trump, I mean, you're an exquisite musician. Um, but, I mean, everybody knows you, and now I know you, right? Ah, uh, well, that's great. Thank you. Well, welcome. And um, you're in Sydney, Australia right now, is if that I correct? Am? Yes. How are things over there? Uh, pretty good. Look, we've got a little bit of a COVID thing going on at the moment in one part of the city. Um, I'm not sure how it works over there, but over here, if they get a few cases, they lock down a suburb or something or just sort of, you know, put in some um, restrictions. So I did have a gig tonight, which has been now been postponed because um, it was right in that area. But other than little uh, things like that coming up every now and then, we're uh, pretty much open and happening and that's all good. And as far as gigs go, yeah, we had a big time there, I'm sure, as everyone did, where there was just nothing happening, which was very strange, um, to suddenly after my whole life playing nearly every night to, to nothing. But that's um, all coming back now, and um, so we've got quite a few things on, some tours coming up, and um, it's looking good. The, the big question for me is when we can go overseas, because for Australians, um, because we're an island and because we're isolated and because we virtually don't have any COVID here, uh, it's very difficult to go in and out. So um, I'm just waiting to see when I can start my international touring again. What about uh, uh, New Zealand? Are you guys able to go back and forth even? Yes. Even yes, New Zealand and Australia are in what they call a travel bubble. So, um, yeah, we can go freely between Australia and New Zealand. But um, uh, much as I love New Zealand, most of the gigs I've got booked at the moment are either in the States or in Europe. So um, I need that to open up. Mm -hmm. Uh, John Foster, friend of mine, you know, I've kind of been following what he's been doing. Do you know John, Baroque trumpet? 
Ah, uh, yes, I know of John, yes. And uh, of course, uh, he's not been traveling outside of Australia either for obvious reasons. But mm. uh, of course, you know, I saw that he was getting back to work and that was encouraging that yes. things were coming back to life. Um, and, uh, you know, I forget, I think as many people do, how big Australia is. So it, an island it might be, but small it isn't. <laughs> no, no, it's an island about the size of the United States. Yeah. So. <laughs> Now, you are uh, native to Australia, Sydney-born or Melbourne? Uh, neither, actually, just in the outback in a little town called Burrawa. Um, but we moved to Sydney. I grew up in Sydney most of most of my life, so uh, I count myself as a Sydney sider, but actually came from the country. So when you say country, are, are we talking like, and you said outback, I mean, truly outback? Yeah. Out west, pretty much out west um, in New South Wales. Uh, the population of the town, I think, at the time was a, around 150. So um, that's where I was born. Um, there were no brass instruments there. Or, uh, you know, the only instruments I saw until we came to Sydney was the uh, the organ in church, or well, the harmonium. Mum used to pedal and play, and the piano. That was it. So, um, oh, and um, and I, I, I hesitate to admit to this, but I also saw some bagpipes. Um, so, uh, but no, no brass instruments, no, no trumpets, trombones, saxophones, no jazz until I got to Sydney. So that was quite uh, a revelation. When I first saw a brass band, I just went, oh my goodness, it was at school. I said, I've, uh, I've got to do that. Well, we're not going to leave the bagpipes alone for, for, I, I want to know, <laughs> did you ever actually, have you tried bagpipes? I've tried the bagpipes uh, only once, just had a go uh, when I, of course, when I was in Scotland, the correct place to do it. Yeah. Uh, for a Morrison, and um, yeah, it's it has its limitations as a bebop instrument. <laughs> it has its limitations <laughs> in tuning. <laughs> There's that too. Yeah. Although, yeah. if you speak to the Scots, it, it's an interesting thing. A Scottish mate of mine said, "No, no, no, you're, you're doing it all wrong." He said, "You're listening to the bagpipes in a setting they're not designed for." He said, "Come up into the Highlands, stand out, you know, early in the morning with the mist on the moors and everything, and then play the bagpipes." And it's true. Suddenly it sounds great. Um, and the tuning is not a problem. It kind of suits the, you know, so. And, of course, bagpipes were never designed to be played along with trumpets and pianos and things. So, again, the tuning, you know, if it's just bagpipes, it actually works. So I've got to stand up for them, you know, a little bit, being of Scottish heritage many, many generations ago. <laughs> but, um, no, as, the, as a bebop instrument, they've certainly got their limitations. So. Uh, how much sure. experience do you have with bluegrass music? Or do you know a lot about I don't know. I certainly don't know a lot about it. I love it. And um, I, uh, you know, what I've heard and particularly um, that bluegrass where they combine it with other um, forms of music and some of the elements of it. I've listened to um, to uh, that wonderful trio with um, uh, now his name's gone out of my head. Edgar Meyer on the bass and oh, Baylor Fleck yeah. on the banjo and um, what they call new grass and um, right. um, amazing stuff. And Mike, Mike on the I'm trying to be surname on, on the uh, mandolin amazing players and um yeah that the music they sort of go wow this has got this has got classical jazz bluegrass and everything all put together and uh, fantastic stuff well you know i i mentioned that because uh it's a celtic influence uh norwegian uh right. and celtic influence in that music and the intonation uh for that you know i think about the bagpipe and of course the setting for the bagpipe is probably the same for bluegrass it's best heard in the mountains of Appalachia and right. <laughs> and West right. Virginia. Yeah. See, so. we're under something here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, and I'm thinking now about Alphorn too. Have you ever played an Alphorn actually in the mountains? Not in the mountains. Again, you know, played it in a room and thought, wow, this thing's amazing. And um, they said to me, oh, you got to hear it when it's played up one end of, a, of a, a valley and you stand at the other end. They said it sounds best about five kilometers away. And normally that's a joke, right? Like the <laughs> south. But this is right. true. It actually yeah. does sound coming for a few kilometers down a valley. It sounds incredible. Yeah. Uh, I went to the International Horn Society. Uh, uh, it's like the ITG of horns. Yep. And uh, this was not public service. That's not why I went. I, I went of my own right. choice, my own volition. Uh, and, a, and I got to experience an Alphorn there. And what a treat. You know, mm -hmm. of course, you, you learn just how, uh, I mean, overtones. I mean, it's just a, another brass instrument. Right? Oh, yeah. It's just another. Yeah, sure. But uh, what, a, what a fun treat that was to get to play that. So Not uh, easy to get into a gig bag and onto the subway. <laughs> right. 
Um, so uh, let's go harmonium. You mentioned harmonium. Mm -hmm. uh, did you learn to play literally at your mother's feet? Were you right uh, there? Yes, yes, yes. And um, it always uh, intrigued me. You had to pedal this thing to make it go. But um, I was—I always loved sitting. I'd sit on one side of my mother. My brother would sit on the other side. And when we we're very small, and she played in church, and uh, you know, you pull the stops out to make the different sounds. Mm -hmm. We discovered that if you push all the stops in, the sound stops. <laughs> Not only does that happen, but if you're pedaling hard at the time, you're likely to go backwards off the stool. So of course, that became our mission, being you know mischievous kids to push all the stops in during church and and cause mum to uh, <laughs> to go flying off the stool and stop him. Anything for a bit of mayhem, as uh, as you do when you're very young. Yeah. So, uh, well, how young? Uh, then I would have been four, mm. um, sitting next to mum, three and four, sitting next to her on the stool. But um, but the sounds of the, that music stayed with me all my life. And those uh, Methodist hymns, it was a Methodist church, Dad as a Methodist preacher, and Mum would be on the organ and hearing those wonderful harmonies and um, cadences and the way that music works, um, I th I'm sure it has influenced me a lot in my music since then. Well, we actually have something more in common because I grew up in the United Methodist Church. And mm -hmm. uh, and my dad, who was career Air Force uh, after he retired, actually became a Methodist preacher. Now, so, I'm not making this up. I'm not making you to think I'm making this up. No, no. My okay. dad was in the Air Force and left that to become a preacher. <laughs> or maybe we're twins separated at birth or something. And, like and it's that. reversed, right? Like, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Dad was in the Air Force and, and then uh, left there to become uh, left there to become a preacher. That's so, wild. Uh, Australian Air Force? Yes. Uh, is that called the RAF? I know we're kind of taking a left uh, turn on this. Uh, the RAAF, because the Royal Air Force is the English one and the Royal yes. Australian Air Force. So RAAF, they call it, yeah. So did you know him while he was in the service or had no, he become a... No, by the time I was born, he was a preacher. Um, okay, I've got a couple of guests. We'll take a, a look to see who's here. Klaus Anselm, a trumpet player friend of mine from, uh, he's up in Canada. And Klaus, I forget if you're in Toronto or Montreal. Uh, Klaus says, fantastic to see you, Larry and James. I've always wondered, and likely this is not an original question, when did your big band album, when you did your big band album, where you played all the instrument except the drums, why not the drums? <laughs> Well, I've done two of those albums. I did one called Snappy Doo, which was a, it's a it's a Ray Brown tune we named it after, and then the second one we very inventively called Snappy Two. Um, and both times it was um, the the first time uh, Ray Brown did play the bass, and um, and Herb Ellis played the guitar, and of course Jeff Hamilton on the drums. Second time when we went to do the sequel, Jeff and I got together and we said, "Who we get on bass and guitar?" And he said, "It's got to be the original band." And I said, "Well, sadly, Ray and Herb have passed." And he said, "Well, then you got to play those." And it's just the two of us. So, um, but never the drums. I can play the bass and the guitar, of course, because um, I played them on the album. I never learned the drums. I never played the drums. And the the reason is just a practical one. My brother is a drummer, so growing up, um, there's only ever one drum kit where we were, and so he was always on it. Um, so I could pick up any other instrument, play anything else I wanted, but I could never get my hands on the drums. So um, by the time I sort of, you know, I don't know, got through to my teenage years, I was playing all the horns and piano and bass and whatever I get, you know, but I'd never really still touch the drums. So I, and it was always covered because he was always there. So um, so I never started playing the drums. Well, I, what, ab I, what about him? Did he uh, leave the drum set, never go to play any of the brass instruments or anything else? Um, he, he plays some trumpet and some trombone and some piano. Yep. Um, it's just a kind of a normal thing in our household. Anyone who plays one instrument is a bit weird. Uh, so, and my sons are the same. Uh, my youngest son, Harry, is a bass player by profession, but he plays piano and trumpet and trombone. And uh, my middle son, William, is a guitarist, also plays in my band, but he plays um, all the saxophones. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, I get, I, I, I half jokingly, but half seriously say that it would be a bit weird in our family if you played one instrument, everyone would say, what do you, what's wrong with you? What are you doing? Yeah, right. <laughs> you have to have them checked out. So, yeah. um, Andrew Davids, uh, huge fans. Thanks so much. Your improvisation is unbelievable. Was it transcription or another method? Uh, for improvisation? How um, you, I'm, I'm assuming he means how did you learn to improve oh, improvisation? Uh, look. Probably looking back on it, there's an element of transcription, but I never actually, I didn't know what that was. Um, I'm self-taught and I didn't, um, I never sat down to, to 
actually do a transcription. Um, but of course, I heard lots of music and loved it, and some things I would listen to many times. So of course, I knew them, and that is definitely transcribing. You know, I could I could sing you the solo or play you the solo. So I would inadvertently transcribed it. But mostly, what I did was just listen to music that I loved, and then say, "Oh, I want to sound like that." Or actually, it's not true. I was never the sound I was after or the notes I was after. It was the feeling. So I'd listen, you know, in the first instance to Louis Armstrong and I'd say how that makes me feel. I want to do something that makes me and the people around me feel like that. It never occurred to me to just necessarily play the same notes the same way. It was more what can I do to create that feeling? And same with all the players. Then I heard Dizzy Gillespie and I went, oh, wow, that's a whole other thing. I want to use all those sounds and ideas too to create the feeling. And so... um um, yeah, I probably did quite a bit of what would, would definitely be classified as transcription. But my ed musical education was very ad hoc and very chaotic and very, what do I feel like doing next? It was not like I had a teacher guiding me saying, now we should move on to this. So I just, um, whatever I felt like I did. And um, so far that's working out pretty well. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe you should go pro, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> You know, um, yeah. It, yeah, it's funny that I spend so much time teaching myself, uh, teaching, you know, I, I have an academy and, and teach, um, having been someone who didn't learn that way and now trying to pass it on. Um, I, I try to make classes and, and, uh, and lessons with myself, um, tap into what worked for me and yet also, of course, take advantage of the fact that it is a structured lesson. So that's an interesting challenge. You know, thinking about the hymn background, I mean, that's that's what uh, you were growing mm -hmm. up listening to, that the four-part uh, uh, functional harmony, right? I mean, the yep. and the, the nice cadences and the amen mm -hmm. at the end. Yes. Um, at what point did you start to hear other things, whether it was jazz, rock, anything else? Uh, well, when we moved to Sydney, I was just about to turn seven. And the first thing I heard there was the brass band, mm -hmm. which in some ways wasn't a whole lot different. It was traditional brass band. So it wasn't a whole lot different than the hymns as far as uh, the harmonies went. Uh, but the rhythms were different. Suddenly there's a march. Suddenly it's it's uh, it's a, you know, um, and of course they had the part of the mar march where it would go to a trio, you know, they, as they called it and change key and all that. And I thought, oh, yeah, this is different. And um I would have been around only a year later, but it seemed like a long time at the time. Uh, when I was about eight, I heard jazz for the first time. And uh, that was in the church. There was um, a, a gospel band and they, they also played um, what we would have called traditional jazz, like, um, uh, you know, New Orleans style jazz. Right. Um, and they would just play hymns that way with a banjo and a, and a tuba and drums and clarinet, trumpet and trombone. Um, but turning hymns into that, and I just went, oh, hang on, what's this all about? Now, now we're talking. And um, and the minister that we had, the preacher at that, when we came to Sydney, it was a much bigger church, and they had more than one preacher. And not my dad, but one of the other guys there, um, the main guy, played the trombone. And I'd seen a lot of sermons. I mean, I grew up, you know, as a preacher's son, and I knew how sermons went. They read something from the Bible, then they start talking about it and tell you what it really means. And they work themselves up. And it gets to a point when they, the Bible gets slammed down on the pulpit, when they make the point, or there's some point where you go, yep, that's the point of the sermon. So I'm used to that. I'm watching the first time I watch this guy preach, and he's leading up to it, and I go, yeah, any moment now he's going to, you know, bang the Bible on the pulpit or something or make the big point. And instead... He reached behind the pulpit and pulled out a trombone, <laughs> launched into a gospel blues. The curtains behind him opened and there was a gospel band there. And I went, oh, hallelujah. I said, now that's what I call a sermon. And, uh, but the whole feeling of that, and you can imagine, of course, you know, we're all familiar with that music, what, what that feels like at the climax of a sermon when the trombone launches on and then the band goes into this gospel groove. Um, that feeling just completely captured me. And um, later on then when I heard a big band for the first time, I went, I recognised this feeling of a big band leading to the shout chorus. That's the bit in the sermon where the preacher makes the point. Um, and so in a, you know, in a secular chart, it's still a story and it still has a climax and it's the shout chorus. And I just went, oh, yeah, this all makes sense to me. And um, I just loved that feeling. And so um, whether it be gospel music, whether it be straight ahead jazz, whether it be whatever, you know, um, rock, funk, anything I'm playing, um, you know, when I play a trumpet concerto, they got the same thing. They've, you know, it does the same thing. And so uh, I just love that feeling and what it does to you when you listen to it. 
and that's what really drew me to music in the first place and 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 is my passion for it i i you know i like the trumpet i'm gonna be careful what i say here i like lots of instruments mm -hmm. um but not like some people i know and i don't at all this is not at all a, a, any kind of judgment or criticism actually i admire it um they love the trumpet or they love the saxophone some people love their saxophone you know what i mean like it's the that actual instrument and they have this real relationship with it and they don't play anything else and it's all about playing that instrument and that's a wonderful thing um just for me it was never like that um you know if it, as i said to someone if someone just switched all my instruments for other ones it wouldn't bother me as long as they're as good um i love the ones i've got but um it's not that and it's not about the trumpet or the saxophone or the piano when i'm playing the trumpet I absolutely love the sound of the trumpet, of course, and you just get completely taken away with, wow, listen to that. I mean, how can you not? Um, but it's the same when I'm playing the trombone. It's the same when I'm playing the piano. At that moment, there's nothing but that instrument. But overall, my motivation for playing is not about the instrument. It's not about the sound it makes. It's not even about the the groove or whatever of, of, of the music, whether it be jazz or whatever, and that it swings, although, I, of course, I love that. It's what it made me feel like when I heard it. And I remember back very young when I first heard some music like this and it gave me this feeling. The people around me, other kids, said, do that again to the band. You know, in other words, I want to feel that again. And the one difference with me was I said, how do you do that? I want to do that. I want to be able to walk into a room and create that feeling. And that's been my motivation for being a musician. And I think that probably set me up for being a multi-instrumentalist because if instead of falling in love with a style or an instrument, I fell in love with what music does to you. So it didn't really matter to me what instrument it was. And, of course, I then chose things along the way. And when I say it didn't matter, I must reiterate, when I'm playing the trumpet, it matters very much that it's the trumpet. That's why I've chosen to play it at that moment. But it doesn't mean that in the next song I won't switch to another instrument and love that just as much. As I say, it's it's the feeling that it creates, and um, that's 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 what I try and teach too. Um, I'm blown away by that. I'm going to have to transcribe the last three or four minutes, and uh, that will be uh, manifesto is not the right word, but you know that's going to have to be. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I I think about an actor, uh, yep. Tom Hanks, who's so talented, mm -hmm. right? You know, he might say, "I love this character," but he loves the character he's playing at the moment. And that's yes. why he, he can communicate so well because he is that person at that moment. When you are, you've got a trumpet in your hands, that's your voice. When you've got a trumpet oh, yeah. in your hands, that's your voice. Yeah. But but what I see, and, and I haven't seen you play live, but I've seen quite a few videos. What makes sense to me is you always look like you're full of joy. Like oh. you are absolutely having a blast mm. on stage. And, you know, there could be one person in the audience, there could only be the band, there could be 5,000 people, right? But it just looks like you're having such a great time. Yes. And, and that's, oh, that's genuine, right? I mean, that's, that's you. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. It's a joy. And I, I suppose it's, it's, um, it's a way that I, you know, like to be. And music is a way of, of creating that feeling and sharing it, of course, with everyone in the room. It's a, I mean, music is a communication. You could just sit there and imagine music in your head and feel like that. But as soon as you make it audible for everybody else, you will, you will get to hear it and all get to feel that. And, yeah, that joy. And I think that's what drew me to certain players, um, certain figures in jazz, too, as I, as I grew up more than others. Uh, it wasn't so much what they played. It was why they played. And so you look at Louis Armstrong. He can play a sad song. He played sad songs. He sang sad songs. But it was all about the joy. It was all, you know, that's what he was about. And um, then you look at Dizzy. And I was very, very fortunate um, to, to know Dizzy and to spend some time with him. And we played some gigs. We did one recording together. And uh, so much joy. He was just, you know, it was like he was constantly at a party. <laughs> so it was almost with Dizzy. Um, just an amazing, you know, love of, of, of life and of sharing that. And, um, and the same with so many players. And you can hear it. Um, uh, why I'm a fan of Errol Garner on the piano. Mm. You know, there's this, you can tell he just loved what he was doing and, and sharing that with everyone. Let's go back a second. You were talking about uh, the request to, oh, do that again. You know, make me feel that again. Mm -hmm. You've, how long did it take you to figure out how to do that, how to replicate that 
feeling? Did were you thinking? Was it a sequence of notes I played? Was it? No, it it it's it very quickly became evident to me, and it wasn't that I could work this out at the age of seven. It was just instinct. It became evident to me that it was all about intention. If you feel something, and you want others to feel it too, and you do something, whether it's speak or act or play an instrument, um, that's the that's the modus operandi. That's how it works. Um, which is why one of the wonderful things about it, it's impossible to be dishonest. Um, you can't be standing there playing something going, well, I think this music is awful or whatever, but whatever I'm getting paid, hopefully they'll like it. They may enjoy it if they know the song, but it's not going to be that feeling we're talking about. You have to feel it and then want to communicate it. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you this quick scenario. This is a little anecdote about what happened. So when I first got a brass instrument, I went to join that school band as soon as we moved to, to Sydney. And you got an audition to get in the band. Now, if we think about that now, that's kind of a weird thing because you don't play an instrument yet. So how are you going to audition? Right. But this is what this guy did. His name was Jack Ackhurst, and he's, he's long since passed. But he was a, an old man then when I was seven. But um, he would audition you for the band like this. He'd say, righto, stick your tongue out. And he was very gruff. He'd say, righto, stick your tongue out. And we'd all do this. He'd say, pretend you've got a tea leaf on the end of it and spit it off. You go, now just keep blowing. <laughs> you do that and he go right and he'd pass you a cornet and he'd go now do it in there and so you'd go <laughs> and of course you'd get some horrible note now if you got a note you were in the band <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't you weren't if you kind of got a note he put you on drums <laughs> um, oh i'm not kidding it was very funny so once he'd shown us that this was our first lesson now, he was a clarinet player running a brass band in a primary school, which is what I think you call an elementary school. We call it primary school. So he's running a brass band. He's a clarinet player. So he hated the band. It was perfect. That's why he was so gruff. You know, he, he liked music and okay, I'll teach the kids, but he would so love to have had, you know, a, a wind ensemble or something. Oh. And they, that was not happening at this school. They had a brass band. So <laughs> we had this clarinetist teaching us to play brass instruments. And he said, that's how you play a brass instrument. And that's all there is to it. You blow down it and then you move your fingers up and down on the thing. And we, I thought we'll learn to read music. And he said, no, we don't, we're not bothering with that nonsense. Um, and this is a brass band. You think, well, if they're not going to read music, how are we going to do this? He said, it's simple. And he would write the fingerings above the notes. So you knew what, what to push mm -hmm. and all the positions for the trombone. And then he would put the record on and we would sit and listen to a record of the piece. He go, listen to your part push the buttons and play that part. And he'd give us the music so you could see the notes so you knew what, what sequence to them in and away you went. So we were playing by ear in a brass band. Now, I would love to hear a recording of that band. There aren't any now because I have no concept of how good or bad it was. But one thing I do know is inadvertently, because he certainly wasn't a jazz player, he was giving me the perfect training to be a jazz player, like start playing by ear right away, hear things, and then work out what they are. And so instead of focusing on these dots on a page and naming them and calling them A, B, C, D, and so on, we weren't doing that. We were just playing what we heard on the record, which is so, of course, how you learn to improvise and transcribe and play jazz. So it was a, 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 great, um, a great beginning. But the first day, I've got to tell you this, um, when you, you ask the question, how about the transmitting that feeling? Mm -hmm. uh, in the very first day, I was handed a brass instrument. I did that. He said, you're in. And once all the ones that were in, go and stand over there. And he said, right, I'll give you a quick lesson. And he showed us fingering one and two, one and three, and open. And he said, now play this note. And he played it on his clarinet. And uh, again, it was all by ear. And we pushed that down and we went, ba. And he said, now this one, da. Now this one, da. He said, okay, I want you to practice those five notes. Uh, those three notes just keep playing through those three notes and um you've got 10 minutes till your parents come now to pick you up and he went left the room as you would you want to get out of there quickly if 20 <laughs> want to play for about to start all having a practice together but i'm sitting there and i'm going beep bo bo with a dreadful sound of course bo be and i went wait a minute that's a song that's a song. And I went, oh. So I quickly grabbed my friend Robert. I said, Robert, Robert, come over here. Try this. Push this one. No, 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 this one. And I'm showing him. Now play it. Now play this one. Now that one. Now three of this one. And I said, Matthew, you come and do this too. And I got these two guys, Matthew and Robert, I'll never forget. And um, 
Uh, one of them's a nuclear physicist now, and the other one's an airline pilot. I'm the only one that made it as a trumpeter. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm doing this, and I'm showing them, and we did it together. And then he came in. He said, right, your parents are here. Pack up. And I said, no, wait, 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 wait. Wait, get them to come in. And I'm seven years old. The parents all come in. I said, listen to this. Listen to this. Ready, guys? Ready, ready, ready? Boo, 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 boo. And I went like this, so we'd do it together. And we played the piece. And, of course, the parents have got tears in their eyes going, wow, it's their first day and they're playing in a band. They're playing a song. And it was all this amazing feeling. Mm -hmm. Now, let's just quickly analyze that now as adults. What did I do the first day? I learned to play an instrument. I formed a band, conducted a rehearsal, <laughs> did a performance and conducted that and received the and in front of an audience and got the applause and like got the the feeling in the room so what was interesting was and i try and do this when i'm teaching particularly really young kids if i'm with them is it didn't matter how good or bad it was or how skilled we were what it was was we completed the sequence the first day we learned a song we put a band together we played for an audience and they all applauded and went wow that's amazing we felt the joy they felt from we said and that in one day we all in the room said that's what this is for instead of work on these things work on these things okay pack up now what's music about so far oh it's struggle it's work it's difficult we said no what's music about it's about the parents all crying and the feeling in the room that's what it's about that was the end result oh this bit that was the thing we did on the way to get to that and that was so evident in the room the first day that stuck with me. So in answer to your question, when did I work that out or learn it? The first day. And I went, I get what this is for. This is for how all the parents looked when we played that piece. And the stuff, the instrument, the practice, the sounds, everything is all a means to an end to create that amazing feeling we had in the room. We all walked out on a cloud. And instead of walking out going, mm, this is going to be tough. Mm -hmm. uh, so that what about the what about what about the director? What was his reaction? Um, he just stood there watching. I, he told me many years later, once I was in high school, he was still there teaching the elementary school, and I'd go back and visit him. He told me, he said, and this was his way. He he loved me, but he said, I could tell from that first day you were going to be trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Starting your own band in competition with mine before you'd even got the thing, you know, in the case. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I think about trouble. But think about how that influenced everybody around you, right? I mean, that was probably an excellent first experience for not just you, Robert, and Matthew, but all the others that, that had joined the band that day, right? Yeah. Yeah. Everyone, everyone just jumped in and said, I want to do that. And what they meant by that was not watching someone play expertly, but the, the performance, the sharing, the, the, the feeling in the room. And so that just stayed with me. And ever since to this day, it doesn't matter what challenges arise or what difficulties or, or what things there are to do or to learn. It was always, yeah, this is this is just like that first day. This is the stuff. Mm -hmm. I had to work it out myself. Then I had to get Matthew and Robert and show them. And then we use it for what it's for. And I think sometimes, particularly with students, they can get, and particularly at a university level, funny enough, not young, but later on, they can get so engrossed because it is getting real complex and they're learning very advanced things that it's a means unto itself. My job here is to learn this. And you go, no, it's not. What this is for is, is that other thing. This is just a means to get there. And um, that can get lost. And if it does, it, it, it can become more difficult, I believe, and certainly can become disheartening and all sorts of things along the way. So um, uh, I always, you know, with my students, I always bring them back to every day. What is this for? Why are we doing this? And the why of playing rather than the how or what. Or They're always subservient. How you play and what you're going to play are very, very important. But they're subservient to why you're going to play. You know, I, I listened to uh, Tina Ting Helset. Yes. And I think, as you're describing this, I think of her in that way. She's not thinking about the technique. She's thinking about that, that feeling, that communication. Yes. Sergei. Yep. I think Sergei is the same. Uh, exactly. And, I mean, all these elite, elite players. It's just, uh, you know, but here I am. You know, I'm still struggling after 43 years playing the trumpet, uh, mm -hmm. still trying to learn more. You know, and but what well, it'll I've learned, do that to you, it'll do that to you. <laughs> yeah, you know, but the whole paralysis by analysis. You know, I mean, at some point, did you experience that? Did you go through a phase where you're you were trying to figure things out technically? No, no. I mean, I've always been working things out technically, but no paralysis, no, no, um, 
there was so strong in me what this was for that um, it was always a means to an end. And another thing, a little analogy that I, I, I like to use is this is like a mountain we're climbing, learning the trumpet, of course, and you're not going to reach the summit. It doesn't exist. Um, you can always find out something more about playing music and about playing this instrument. How disheartening is that? If you think of it in those terms, <laughs> so you, you're climbing, you're climbing, you're climbing, you're looking up, you're looking up and where you're looking is always above you. And that's what leads you forward. That's all good. But that is going to become a drag. That is going to get you down sometimes. That is going to, you know, sometimes it's very motivating, but sometimes it's not. The, in, in that analogy, I just say to my students, okay, stop, turn around. And, of course, we all know when you climb a hill even, let alone a mountain, you climb for a little while, it's a drag, you turn around, what do you always say? Wow. Because you look at the view from here. You're not at the summit. You're not done. But check out the view from here. You can go 10 steps and the view's better. <laughs> so I always say to them when we go to, you know, play and we, we might be on a performance, you know, and I've got a student um, big band there and they're working. And I go, no, 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 stop climbing. We're now <laughs> going to share where we're up to with this crowd tonight. So would everyone please turn around and look at the view from here and as you play, describe the view from here to the audience say, wow, this is what I can do. This is where I am up to. Listen to the sounds I can make. Not, oh, I'm working on that. It's not good enough yet. They go, no, where is it now? And so I always, we always, and sometimes that's all I've got to say with a student that I work with often. They'll come in, they go, I'm just, gonna, I go, view from here. They go, oh, that's right. <laughs> um, and we, we have that analogy, but it's, it's true. Um, don't get in front of an audience or get with friends to play for joy and be working on stuff that's the time to actually now go okay let's you know make camp here and enjoy the view and and celebrate what we've done and where we are and then sure tomorrow in your practice room or at rehearsal or whatever turn around start climbing uh, you know this uh, andrew david's here at the bottom he he just put do you still give lessons and the answer to that question is yes i mean we we're in one right now. <laughs> um, but you you keep talking about your, your teaching, um, your students. Where are you teaching currently? Okay. So I have an academy in South Australia, um, which is, uh, as the as it suggests, it's a built, you know, it's a building. It's, it's a physical uh, academy. People are enrolled there doing um, degrees, um, you know, a bachelor's degree in, in the usual way you would. Um, when I say in the usual way, I mean the structure is, is you know, What's going, mm -hmm. the way we do it is probably not the usual way. Um, but I already have plans. I've decided I've been doing that now. I started the academy six years ago. And we've had, so uh, you know, a couple of, um, a few, uh, pe you know, graduations through there mm -hmm. that um, I want to find a better way of doing that. And by better, I mean something that it's, I mean, it's in South Australia and, you know, a number of people come there from around the world, but it's just that number of people. And, uh, I'm, I'm figuring I want to try something else. And a, an idea I've had recently is like the pop-up academy. Like what if when I can travel around the world again, when COVID allows us, um, that I could say, okay, the James Morrison Academy yeah. is going to be here in, um, you know, in Monk, just outside Vienna uh, for, for, for three weeks or for one month. Come and attend that academy and we'll do an intensive thing and we'll spend time together and, and do that. And then it's going to be in London and then it's going to be in Tennessee and then it's going to be in wherever, in South America and just move around with the academy and i, I kind of like that idea because there are people all over the world you want to connect with and and pass things on to and uh so i'm i'm thinking about uh that for the future so uh, maybe it's the covid thing got me thinking like that i'm thinking well everyone's locked down everyone's where they are when we can move again i kind of felt like i want to get out there well um, indianapolis has to be on your one of your uh, locations absolutely Absolutely. It's funny you should mention it. Indianapolis, I think, just went to the, the top of the list for the first pop-up academy. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I'm going to put my application in as soon as we're done here this evening, too. I'll make sure that I'm, I'm at the top of that list. Uh, and my audition will simply be, right? That's it. You're in. You're That's in. all I have to do. <laughs> you know, you think about just how simple you can make it, right? I mean, teaching somebody mm -hmm. how to play an instrument. And you think about how difficult you can make it, you know, if that that first 
experience with a trumpet player, you know, you start talking about breathing and posture and diaphragm and how to hold the mouthpiece and how to hold the trumpet. And, you know, and, and 15 minutes in the kids, like, I wish I joined choir. <laughs> right. I mean, yep. but, but to, to be able to get that experience right away, and I'm not saying every beginning experience is that way, but um, yeah, I mean, what a, what a great experience for you. And, you know, it didn't just happen to you. Now, by extension, it's happening to a lot of other people. Sure. But look, I've got to say, though, there is a place for then talking about posture and breathing and oh. all of that stuff. Yes. It's, 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 and it's, and not just a particular time you get to when you're playing, go, okay, now we do all that stuff. I think you need to move in and out of it. Like I said, you've got to sort of say, okay, it's time we just actually played. And then you, now let's work on this with your posture or your breathing or whatever, this particular technique, or let's talk about mouthpieces. And then we don't want to stay there. We do some work on that, and then we should go back to just playing. And I think you move in and out of that so that you maintain that sort of balance. And so you keep connecting what you're doing to the end result that's designed to bring about rather than say, when I'm done with all this, then I will be a joyously a trumpet player. It's going to be too many years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you need to enjoy the trumpet player you are now along the way, but absolutely delve into all of those things. And because um, sometimes I think people might get the impression I'm saying, don't worry about all that. And I'm going, no, no, we'll, we'll worry about all that. Mm -hmm. We'll, we'll deal with all of that. But um, as it, as and when it's going to be beneficial rather than just going, here's the curriculum. And we're going to follow that. And uh, now we're going to spend six months talking about this. You go, well, maybe. And that's why with my academy, even with a bachelor degree, if someone came and said, um, can we please see the curriculum? I'd go, not really. Um, I, I can tell you, I can very detailed what you must know at the end to receive the degree. And that has to be because it's you know got to be certified and all that sort of mm -hmm. thing. How you will get there will depend on what sort of where you're at, how mm -hmm. quickly you learn certain things. And so within one, you know, group one year um, at the academy, you might say, here are our sophomores. What are they up to? You go, oh, depends on who they are. Mm -hmm. and each one is taking a path <laughs> that um, is designed to what do they need to do next to, to progress rather than this is what we're doing today. And I, th I think that's really, if you can do that, that's really important. Well, even from a, a, the teacher, the educator's perspective, from your view, right, it's, how much more rewarding is that, that you're not just oh. teaching Haydn this semester and Hummel this semester and, you know, the BAME or, or whatever method, right? I mean, this is, it's getting you and probably pushing you at the same time. Absolutely. Oh, it's for, for an educator teaching like that, you've got to be way more involved in where that student is up to, to decide what to do next, rather than just, you know, saying, well, here's what I teach next. Also, and by the way, it's not by way of criticizing anyone who teaches that way because that would be really silly because there are so many great players out there that have learned that way. So obviously that works. I'm just saying how it worked for me and how I like to teach it. Obviously, it would be silly of me to try and teach a way that I didn't learn. Um, that would that would be strange. Uh, but but I, I find um, we do the same thing. I'll give you a practical example with a lesson. It's normal to have a lesson at three o'clock on Thursdays, if that's when your time is. And each Thursday you go at three o'clock for your lesson. We don't do that. Um, why would you be ready at precisely three o'clock next Thursday for another lesson <laughs> if you just had one? Depends okay. on what work I just gave you and how hard you work at it and how much time you've got to spend on it and how quickly you get on with it. And so how often, and this will be an experience everyone out there I think will resonate with, both teachers and students, and let's face it, we're all both, um, when you've turned up to a lesson, whether you're the teacher or the student, and you know there's really no need for a lesson now, it's going to be supervised practice. Like they're going to show me what I gave you last week. Okay, well, you're still not doing that. Yeah, I've got to do it more. You go, then why are we here? <laughs> um, I'm just supervising you doing the practice you're supposed to be doing on your own. And that can often happen. So what we do with, our, uh, with the academy is we say, come and have a lesson. I give you some work and I go, okay, let me know when you're ready for the next one. That could be in two days' time, could be in a week, it could be 10 days. You might say, I don't need a whole another one-hour lesson yet, I need 10 minutes with you. And students do that. They go to the front desk and they say, I need 10 minutes with James, or I need a lesson with James. That gets put on my schedule. And they walk in and I go, hi, what are you here for? Rather than me saying, here's what I'm going to teach you. And they say, that thing you showed me, I need 10 more minutes on it. There's a couple of things I don't understand. Or I'm ready for another lesson, I've got that down, let me show you. And that way we know that, and the reverse works too. I can watch someone in a class, in an ensemble or whatever, and go, I need to get with that trumpeter and talk to them about what they're doing. So I tell you the front desk, 
please let Trish know um, she's got a lesson with me. Schedule it in. And she just gets a message saying, you've got a lesson with James at 3 o'clock on Thursday. She doesn't know why. She turns up and I say, I was watching what you're doing in, in, the, on, in the big band and I need to talk to you. Let's work on that. And so it means every lesson, at least one person in the room knows why they're there and has a reason for being there now rather than, oh, we're both here because it's Thursday and it's 3 o'clock. Mm. Now, I understand that in a situation where I've got a bunch of students who are enrolled in an academy and we're all in a closed circuit, so to speak, that that's possible. And for a regular teacher with students coming from all over the place, you couldn't run it like that. I get it. You've got to slot people in at three o'clock on Thursday. But I just use an example of showing a way of thinking, of um, uh, teaching when and what is required next or when it seems like the student is ready or the teacher is ready or both to, to move on to the next thing. Um, that way of, of teaching is how I learnt. I just went in search of what I needed next once I was done with what I was working on. And um, and so I try and teach that way. So and to some degree, you, you can bring that in as an element of any schedule, even, even the three o'clock Thursday schedule, you can still bring in that way of thinking. Do you look at the way you learned as things came very naturally to you or because I'm thinking, you know, it's, how and how do you know how to communicate that to a student? If if you didn't have the same trial as in, in tribulations, right? How are you able to communicate and connect? The thing that I've worked on the most in my life is not playing an instrument. Even though I'm a multi-instrumentalist, there's all those instruments to learn. That is by far not the thing I've worked on the most. The thing I've worked on the most um, and, and actually made a study of is how to take something that's in my mind or in my heart and transfer it to someone else, how to communicate, how to take something that may be complex or esoteric or even abstract and pass that on. And um, that is what I do when I'm on stage holding a trumpet. And I, I, I do um, quite a bit of speaking and um, uh, I, I go to um, large companies, you know, often will will engage me to come and speak to their management. And they do that. You know, they get Olympic skiers to come. They get musicians to come. It's like a thing so they can get other perspectives. What they get me to come and do is um, is to talk to them about, you know, the analogies of music and show them, you know, how that can relate to their business. And that's that's a, a thing that, you know, is, is not terribly innovative. Lots of people do that. However, one of the things I'll say to them is, um, you all know me, you know, they know me, they've seen me, I'm and in Australia, particularly I'm on television, I'm whatever, and they go, yeah, we, we know you. And so you figure I must be a really good trumpet player, and they all go, yes, I said, there may be a trumpeter in the room here who can actually make a, you know, a, a more qualified judgment. Mm -hmm. But I said, I'm not being rude, but none of you would have a clue. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know how good a trumpet. How would you know? You don't know how hard it is to play the trumpet? You don't know how I compare to any other trumpeter. And even if I put another trumpeter beside me, unless they did something very, very graphic, like played faster or higher, you wouldn't know who was better. You can't play the trumpet. You don't know enough about music even. And they're all looking at me. And I say, this is true. And yet you're all prepared to say, oh, James, oh, he's one of the best. You know, you wouldn't have a clue. Everyone listens to music. And let's take all those people out there who aren't musicians at all, who have their favorite artists. They don't just say, I like this one best. They say, that one's the best. They make that judgment. What they mean is that one connects with me the most. Mm. Right. They wouldn't have any idea how good a singer, whoever is. You know, if I start picking singer, you know, famous pop artists, some of them are way better musicians than others. Now, as musicians, we can probably listen and say, well, this one's got way better pitch. And this is, a, we can probably judge who's a better singer. But that's not what people are doing. Of course, it's how does it connect with them? And so what I say to them is my greatest talent's not playing the trumpet. It's connecting with the audience. Mm -hmm. I could play the trumpet half as well as I do and be just as successful as far as the general public goes. Now, I might not have so many friends in the trumpet community. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, that's the point. It's not that, oh, great, I don't have to be so good. No, no, of course you want to be as good technically and, and, and have facility as you can because you don't want to limit your ideas. And your ideas, you know, when you're improvising particularly, are limited by what you can play. Um, you, you know, I, I, if I have an idea that I can't technically play, you're never going to hear it. Mm -hmm. So that's, of course, the case. But, no, what I do best is, is connect. And so um, I've worked out a way, whether it's when I'm speaking, you know, teaching someone, explaining something, or standing on, trumpet, uh, standing on stage holding a trumpet, of saying to an audience, 
I'm going to play some bebop for you now. You're not going to have any idea what's going on because I happen to be like, you know, in a church hall on a Sunday afternoon. There's not, it's not like I've gone to a jazz club mm -hmm. and I've done a lot of performances. You know, I play for corporate audiences and I'll play them some pretty heavy jazz and um, they love it. They don't know why. <laughs> um, and it's not about, if, it's not a matter of the material. It's a matter of why I'm doing it and how I'm doing it and connecting with them and getting them to feel what I'm feeling when I play that material. And they don't need to know why. And I think that's one of the amazing things about music is you can have anyone listen to, you know, um, uh, some Bach. And you know that thing when you listen to, to Bach, particularly, you know, the sort of stuff I'm talking about when I say this, mm -hmm. where your consciousness expands while you're listening to it. Mm -hmm. The world just recedes and... And as it's coming to a close, just all is right with the world as you hear this cadence. Now, well, you and I can sit and say what cadence it is and what the harmonies are, but the person next to us who's not a musician is feeling the same thing. They don't even know what a cadence is, and they don't need to. And I say that's one of the most amazing and wonderful things about music. It's not necessary to understand hmm. to get the feeling. And uh, whereas often with words it is. You have to understand the language and what the person's saying and the concept before you get the feeling from it. Music is this much more direct communication, and that's why I, one of the things I think is so wonderful and important about music is uh, is its communication that seems to go straight from the uh, the person making it audible, if I put it that way, mm -hmm. to the person hearing it. So um, with all of that, I, I suppose uh, my idea of how to uh, communicate ideas when I'm teaching, not having gone through the same process as perhaps or the same experiences as a lot of my students are going through. I've learned a lot over the years, I've got to say that, because um, sometimes they'll struggle with something that I didn't struggle with. Mm -hmm. um, what I have to do then is is listen and work out, you know, and and, and, and try and experience what, what it is they're having trouble with. Often, not always, but often I find the fact that I haven't had a struggle with that can be an advantage in teaching mm -hmm. them because instead of empathizing which is a great thing we know empathy is wonderful but instead of empathizing, saying yeah i had that problem here's how i got over it i just say to them that problem doesn't exist and here's how it looks when it doesn't i can absolutely show you describe to you if we sit here for a little while you will start to feel what it's like to be in a world where that doesn't exist now try it and so they never do work out the problem it just disappears because it isn't one um, and so that that works a lot of the time. Um, so, but I've got faculty at the academy who are very different to me. We all have the same ethos and empathy and everything else. But I've got some amazing players who have worked every day and for everything they've got and have struggled and have overcome. And we sit there together, marvelling at how wonderful it is that these students can either come to me for that that way of doing it or go to them for the other way, and they actually benefit from both. And I think, um, you know, just as we want every kind of player out there, we want every kind of teacher too. I'm just one kind. Well, <clears throat> okay, let's go back to that first day uh, that you, you made the band. You, you learned how to play the trumpet, you formed a band, you put on a performance, but you also became an educator that day. I did, yeah, I guess, yeah, I, I, I sat there and um, passed on what I just worked out to, to Robert and Matthew. And that just seemed a natural thing to do. I know this, you don't. I'll show you, then you'll know it. it it's really that simple. <laughs> so, uh, uh, at, at your academy, you don't just teach trumpet, do you? Or do you oh. also know what what else you teach? Sax, trombone, piano, bass, everything. Piano, yeah, wh whatever, whatever's needed, and um, and of course uh, arranging and uh, and um, uh, ensemble, you know, and, and improvisation, of course. So that was um, yeah. actually going to be uh, my next question is uh, arranging and composing. Is this mm -hmm. something that, uh, what have you done? What do you like to write? I've done a lot of um, arranging and quite a bit of composing. I've done more arranging than composing, but uh, plenty of originals out there. And um, uh, yeah, I like to, I, I've often written, most of my life I've written for projects. I don't just sit down and write because mm. I'm writing a song. Um, my one of my sons, William, does that. He's a songwriter. He sits down and writes a song. I say, "What's this for?" He's, "I don't know." <laughs> to me, I'd go, "Well, then, why are you writing a song?" <laughs> um, um, but that's because I've said, "Oh, I've got a, uh, you know, I'm going to do a big band tour coming up. I want some new stuff to do on that. What do I want? And I want a piece like this and a piece like that." So I start arranging. 
um, to, to sort of um, answer those questions, if I can put it that way. Yeah. Um, very occasionally in my life, I've just got an idea for a song for no particular reason. And by that, I mean no, no particular use. Um, there's obviously a, a reason I've gotten this idea, and so I, I write a song. Um, but mostly I go, oh, I'd love a song like this, so I write one. Um, so it's, it's usually answering a question uh, when I write, um, which may, leads me to the thing that I refer to some people as writers. Um, I can write, I can arrange, and um, I do and I will all my life, but I don't call myself a writer. Mm-hmm. I think writers are those people who, unlike myself, who are going, I need a child, I'll write one, who write because they write, if you know what I mean. I think they're the writers. And I, I know I'm very fortunate to know a number of great writers, and they're all like that. Um, they don't say, what's this for? They go, it's because I'm writing. I've got something to, you know, to create here. Probably the same way I feel about playing. I could imagine being a composer and and for James to say to the composer, uh, I want you to write this. And knowing how you play, they're, they're pretty much unlimited. Okay, I can write. I can write it, him playing this on the trumpet, and I can write him playing this on the trombone or this on the sax. You know, it's, uh, well, I don't know. It also might scare a composer to death <laughs> to have that uh, task. Actually, of it often scares me to death. Um, <laughs> what <laughs> happens, I, I have, I've had it happen enough times now because I've, I'm very fortunate that I've had a number um, of concerti written for me. There's been, I think, three or four trom- uh, trumpet concertos. And, um, and a trombone concerto written for me by some great writers. Um, I mentioned Edgar Meyer, the bassist earlier, um, who is just, I, I don't need to say, but I must say, is just such a phenomenal musician. I mean, does anyone play any instrument, you know, better than Edgar Meyer plays the bass? Uh, not that I've heard yet. Um, and I was very fortunate that um, I was the director of a music festival uh, in Queensland in Australia, a quite a large festival. And uh, one of the things we commissioned, um, you know, indulgently for me, I said, I want a double concerto for trumpet and double bass with symphony orchestra um, written for myself and Edgar Meyer. And, um, and we'll perform that. And we did. Mm-hmm. Um, now, all these things, uh, all these different um, pieces that have happened, what I worked out very quickly was these composers were doing exactly what you're suggesting. They went, oh, James can play. Listen, I've heard James play this and this and this. I'll write that. Mm. And um, why? Because they heard it, it excited them, they loved the feeling, and they said, I want to put that in my piece. So I sat down with the composer after about three um, times as it happened, and I said, it doesn't work. Hmm. And here's why. What you're feeling when I play like that is not the notes. Otherwise, you could just write the notes down and get anybody to play it. Hmm. I'm improvising. And what you're feeling is the joy of freedom of I'm just expressing myself. The notes aren't important. The feeling I've got is, do you understand if you write that out and I have to read it and learn it, you've just created the opposite feeling. Same notes, but for the opposite reason. Instead of complete freedom, it's complete. I have to read like something. Have you ever tried to read something you've played when you've been improvising? It's nearly impossible. And so they write these incredibly difficult things, which are similar to what I would play so I can play them. But I've got to work like crazy and stick to the chart and read and and learn. And so it's the opposite feeling. So I said, it doesn't work. If you want that feeling in your piece, and I hope you do, fantastic. At that point, just put a dashed line and write, go for it. Um, (laughs) You know, that's it. Don't write anything and then you'll get that. And by all means, give me some clues, put some chord changes if you want, or put some um, high fast lines, you know, write a description or low fast lines or long high notes or put something like that but don't write exactly what you want because then I'll read it and then you'll get a different feeling. Mm. If the feeling you're after is the feeling here, and they would, they would bring up certain recordings and say, this feeling, I go, I was improvising. Mm. So to get that feeling, you'll have to have me improvising. Mm-hmm. And um, that was a lesson I had to learn about talking to composers um, and say, you know, they would ask technical things like, I want you to play trumpet and trombone this, how quickly can you switch? Or, you know, how often can you switch? I said, do what you like. That's, that's fine. Yeah, go, go crazy. Um, but as far as what you want me to play, if you give me hard things to read, um, then you get that atmosphere of hard reading, which is great, but it's a different atmosphere. If you want the improvisational atmosphere, the only way to get that is to leave me improvising. So that was an interesting thing. And I'm careful to do that when I write for myself. Um, I, can, I, I seriously, early on, made the same mistake on myself. I'd go, I know what I'll write here, and I'd write something. 
that would sound like me. But then I'd have to read it. <laughs> I went, that's really silly. Um, so I stopped doing that. Well, you go back and you're mentioning, <clears throat> excuse me, Louis Armstrong and, and Dizzy mentioning those guys yes. and and thinking about the tunes that they would have been playing where it would have just really been uh, the framework, right? I mean, no tune was ever the same. No. I mean, obviously with improvisation, but even the head was probably never the same each time. Oh. Mm -hmm. And, you know, depending, well, how many voices are on stage, right? That's going to change the feel. Yep. The venue is yep. going to change the feel. I mean, the time of day is going to change the feel. How much you've had to drink is going to change, right? It, uh, okay, so I guess what I'm getting to now is you mentioned those guys. But yep. who, do you, who do you see out there today that, that does that still? Wow. Um, there are a number of people. That's, that's, there, there, there are quite a few. Um, mostly people that, um, you know, those listening to us aren't going to know. Um, I mean, I've got, I've got um, ex-students that are out there doing that now and play that way. Um, it's, it seems to be there are categories, not just styles of jazz players. You know, someone might say, well, I'm, I'm more into, um, you know, uh, funk. I'm more into bebop. I'm more into swing. I'm more into this. Um, there also seem to be categories of, of players of how they approach. They seem to fall generally into two camps. And there's the I'm going to work all this out and create something wonderful. I'm going to craft my performance mm -hmm. from the beginning and set it all up. And uh, that doesn't mean there isn't improvisation in it, but the arrangements for the heads are all worked out and rehearsed, and it's amazing. It's fantastic, and particularly, of course, if they, if they do it well. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are those that go, I, and they tend to really go the other way, go, I'm just going to get on the bandstand and call some tunes and see what happens. And, um, and there are both out there. Mm -hmm. I do performances, of course, where I've worked something out and written it down, particularly if it's with a large ensemble. That works very well. But... When I'm playing with my quartet, most of the time, we almost studiously, if I can put it this way, stay away from working stuff out. Mm -hmm. um, I like the feeling of getting up on stage. And when I walk on for a concert, I'm just, just talking about a jazz club where you can be pretty relaxed and even say to the crowd, oh, we're just working out what to play next, you know, and bring them in on the conversation, which mm -hmm. I do sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm talking about a big concert hall and a formal concert. Um, I will still walk out in front of my quartet and as I come out and they say, please welcome James Morrison, you've got 2,000 people in the concert hall, and I walk out, I still don't know what song we're starting with. Um, so I'll, I'll walk out on stage and just think of something as I walk out there. What do I feel like playing right now? And start playing, and the sure. band works out what it is and joins in. Um, so I still like that. Um, my, my screen froze up for just a second. Um, Thomas Gotch. I yes. think is is one of those that that communicates so yes. well. Absolutely. Um, and I know Absolutely. you guys have shared the stage uh, mm. a few times. <laughs> um, I I just I think back to um, well, hang on, uh, uh, sidetrack here a second. I, I see some questions here. I want to get to these questions on the side, okay. and also recognize some people that that are here. Andrew Davis has had a few questions. We'll get to that. I do want to say hi to Josh Cohen. Uh, Josh, if you don't know, is a fantastic uh, musician, uh, Baroque trumpeter. And uh, Josh, thanks for being here tonight. Um, Eddie Davis, uh, he mentioned that he saw you in Chicago a few years ago. Uh, he said Louis Armstrong was the same. He looked happy playing. That goes back to my, my question about that earlier. Um, let's see. Such wise words. Greg Hurst says, uh, yeah, and I'm sure he's not talking about me. <laughs> oh, Bruno, <laughs> Bruno Garcia, uh, the trumpet, mm -hmm. the trumpet community's favorite uh, uh, South American connection. Right. Mm. Uh, hello, Bruno. Um, and uh, he says hi to James. Uh, Shane Connor, a friend of mine up here in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. He's asking, do you ever get nervous when you're going to be playing a concert with some of the other trumpet greats? Or do you look forward to it with anticipation? Oh, definitely the latter. Yeah, no, nervous is not uh, not one of my um, not not in my playbook. Uh, <laughs> I and, and that comes from another incident. I'll give you the quick anecdote there. I I was going to do my first solo performance, so I'm playing in the brass band at school, and I get nervous like any other kid, and I'm worried I'm going to play wrong notes and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then comes my first solo, 
and uh, it was a, I was eight years old. I was playing the trombone. It's a Sunday afternoon at what we call a memorial hall, and it's like one of those community halls. All the parents are there. Everyone here knows what I'm talking about. You know, each kid gets on. One's tap dancing, one's singing. You know, and someone's playing the trombone. It's a little variety concert for the kids. And all the parents sit there dutifully listening through everyone else's kids' performance, waiting for their kid, who, of course, is the best. Um, so I'm going to play this trombone solo. It's the first time I've been on stage on my own, standing mm. out there. Now, I've got an accompanist on the piano, but other than that, you know, it's my solo. So I'm I'm nervous. I'm thinking, wow, now if I play a wrong note, unlike in the brass band where it's okay to be covered <laughs> by someone else in the section, it's all out there. I get out there to play. And I went for a sixth position. The song was called Lucy Long. It goes, and when you go down, you go you quickly down to sixth position. I let go of the slide. It went flying <laughs> off the end into the audience. It hit a lady in the third row, um, which is great range, by the way. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I got no slide. And we all know what the trombone sounds like without the slide. You just got a tube just goes, and that's it. Now, I'd been told not to stop. They said, don't stop. Because what kids do when they're that old, if they make a mistake, they stop and they burst into tears. And they said, whatever happens, just keep going. So I took the advice. And I'm still going like this with no slide. I'm doing the hand movements. And what you're hearing is do, 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 the one note all the way to the end of the piece. The company is looking at me like this. I got a standing ovation. Of course. I mean, what would we all do? Watching some eight-year-old persevering right. right to the end of the piece with no slide. We'd go, that's that's awesome. Um, but the thing is, for me, for me, the experience was I knew it had seriously gone wrong. The slides come off. I mean, that's as bad as it gets. I went to the end, but everyone's smiling and clapping. They stood up. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. I should be in trouble. I screwed up, right? That's how life works. You screw up, you get in trouble. And they're all happy. And I kid you not. For whatever reason, my eight-year-old mind went, that's because I'm on stage. And there's some truth in that. I'm standing up on stage, I'm performing. And so provided I put on the performance and play to the end, it doesn't really matter whether the slide falls off or not. It's all about the vibe sort of thing. I, I didn't work that out. All I knew was I just, I, I just connected that to being on stage and said, when you're on stage, everyone's going to smile. Everyone's going to clap. Everyone's going to enjoy it. Long as you do, they will. That's what you're there for. And it just reinforced that thing I'd learned that first day about what music's for. Now I'd added the thing to that. This is what stage is for. A perform Being on stage is about everyone being happy. And so I walked off. I've never been nervous since, no matter what. Because I go, oh, I'm back on stage. I'm home. It's fine now. I get nervous when I leave the stage. Like, what's going to happen in life? <laughs> out there? But the stage, I go, I'm home. We're cool. And so, when, of course, getting together with other great trumpeters or great musicians of any sort is always just exciting. I stood next to Dizzy Gillespie for the first time. We started trading fours. One part of my brain says, you're trading fours with Dizzy Gillespie. You idiot. <laughs> like, this, this cannot end well. Um, but the other main part of me went, this is awesome. This guy sounds great. Like, of course. But just the music. Like, forget that it's Dizzy Gillespie and the history and the legend he is. But of course, you have respect for that. But he's playing these notes. Play some notes. Answer him. And it was just, of course, wonderful. Um, so, uh, no, the, the the bigger the occasion, probably I would say it does affect me. The more excited I get, the more I look forward to it. Um, but, no, I, I, the, the nerves after that day has never happened again. Um, but I have made quite a study of nerves and why other people get nervous and how it works. And I do a whole thing on that with my students. Um, people sometimes come to me just for lessons in dealing with their nerves. They say, can I get with you and do the nerves thing? And I work with them on that. And um, it's, uh, yeah, I'll put that in the Pop-Up Academy. We'll do that. It's, um, it, it, it's, it's not a difficult thing in most cases to deal with and, um, and, to, and to pretty much eradicate. I'm sure, you know, there are the odd case where people have a deeper thing going on, but mostly um, it's not that hard to deal with. Well, you mentioned that you would go and talk to companies, right? Non mm -hmm. non musical organizations, right? Yeah, I could see where even talking to salespeople, right, who who have trouble communicating, right? The the nerves, mm -hmm. I mean, they're on stage when they're trying to make a sale, sure. right? I mean, do you ever communicate that sort of thing in those oh, absolutely. talks? Absolutely. Oh, that's a big part of it. That's a big part of it. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. It's it when we when we take the music, which, of course, as I've said, I believe is, is 
let's even call it a higher form of communication often than words. But when we set the music aside and what we say is, look, what we're trying to do here is connect with other human beings. Well, that's what you're trying to do when you're trying to sell them something. Um, and that's, you know, there, there are all the other things that come in there. Should you be selling them this? Do they really need it? And all that. But given that, you know, you're helping someone out who wants to get something and you're, you're the salesman helping them, um, you're communicating with them. And when you're playing music, you're communicating with people. When you're teaching people, you're communicating with them. Uh, when you're a student and you walk into a teacher, you need to communicate with the teacher or they won't know the experience you're having and what, what to do next for you. So given that, yeah, the, the skills in communicating and the ways of communicating and the nervousness you might feel if you are someone who has the information to impart to another, whether that be some music you're going to play for them or or whatever, sure, they're, they're all the same. It's all the same. It's all about how you communicate and connect with people. And um, that's, you know, that's such a great way of doing that is to stand up and play a trumpet, you know. Wow. Well, I'm thinking about your students, right? And you're, you're, like you said, you're working with them to not just learn the instrument, but to achieve what you're talking about. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking for them that first time that that happens, right? That they transcend the technique. Yes. Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, rewarding for them, but also... <laughs> So, I'm sorry, say that again. I say I call that being there. If I'm standing there when that happens, I love to be there when the lights come on. That's what I call that. Yeah. Well, and that was what I was going to say. That's got to be a real uh, uh, a joy, not to be redundant, of course, with that. But that's got to be a joy for you as well to, to yeah. see that and to realize, okay, they're going to be okay. They're going to do just fine. It's, it's not just a joy. It's also inspiring. It's very mm -hmm. inspiring. And um, to to see the lights come on, to see someone transcend uh, limitations and then start to really express and communicate is very, very inspiring. And you never learn anything so well as when you teach it. And so um, that just keeps reinforcing in you as, as, the, as the educator what it is that you're teaching. And you learn it better every time you teach it, which, of course, is a cycle. Then you can teach it better. Mm -hmm. I, I imagine every student is a friend for life. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very much. Right. Mm. Uh, um, uh, Bruno wants to follow up. He he wants to say, tell him to be careful with spiders. That's obviously an inside oh. joke there. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. And that's so fitting coming from him. <laughs> uh, given that this is South America, because I, I'm sure, well, I'm not sure. You may or may not know that I had quite an episode uh, um where I got bitten by a spider. I was on a way to a gig um, in Brazil um, and uh, for Trumpet Festival and uh, in Sao Paulo, and um, I got bitten by a Chilean recluse spider, which um, I was informed by the doctor when I finally ended up in hospital. Um, they had a patient bitten by the same spider the week before who died. Um, she was telling me this. Normally, that's not good bedside manner, but I was being a bit flippant and going, i got to get out of here. i got a gig. And they said, you're not going anywhere. I said, yeah, I'll be fine. They said, last patient died in the bed you're in right now. I went, hmm, maybe I can change my flight. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that was quite an episode. Um, I only have two fears uh, in life, um, two phobias, I guess, if you like. One is spiders and the other one is hospitals. <laughs> well, and for obvious I reasons. In one. I ended up in hospital for 10 days because uh, I got bitten by a spider. So, Well, uh, isn't Australia kind of known for these these spiders that are like dinner plates? Yes. I mean, they're huge, oh, well, right? We have, we have many of the most deadly spiders in the world and to throw in snakes as well, just for good measure. And I've never been bitten by anything my whole life. And, I, you know, I'm from here. I go on a trip uh, to South America, which who is the other place which has all the really good spiders. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, got bitten. But um, anyway. It's uh, I, I just have to laugh the fact that my um, you know, my two phobias came together in one go there, but I still did the gig. Um, I was bitten and I was in a lot of pain. I didn't know what had happened, I, yeah. I didn't know I'd been bitten. Um, but I just knew that my leg was swelling up and that I was very ill. But I managed to sit down and play a gig with a big band for this trumpet festival and then basically go back to the hotel and collapse and then end up in an ambulance. Wow. But um, I love saying, because I tell my students, the gig must go on. Even if you're dying from a deadly South American spider, <laughs> you've got to play the gig first before you die. <laughs> well, Bruno said the concert was great. So, <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Bruno. I don't know. I don't know how. I can't judge how I was, whether I was at my best or not, because of what the what I was laboring under. But I certainly gave it my all, that's for sure. Well, I had mentioned John Foster earlier, and John chimed in. Uh, some of the greatest experiences I've had been have been playing with James on stage. Legend. 
Wow, that's great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, James, thanks for being here. Bruno, everybody, thanks for being here. I, I would do want to uh, back up to Shane's question. Uh, what With what beverage do you fill your Abrodato mouthpiece? Ah, <laughs> my Abrodato. <laughs> um, because, yeah, it has water in it, of course. That's what it's mm -hmm. supposed to have in it. But I make jokes every now and then, like, you know, perhaps we get a different sound. If we're going to play a blues, you might put scotch in there. <laughs> um, um, uh, it's not recommended, by the way, I should say. Shargle don't recommend putting anything in there but water. Um, and I have had some fun saying to people, well, if you can get some water from the Alps, some alpine water, I mean, real alpine water from a stream, it's going to really help your high register. Um, and of course, we're all trumpeters, right? You know, we'll fall for anything that's going to help our high register, just in case it's true, even if it sounds dodgy. Uh, excuse me, me I, I'm going to order some on Amazon right now. Excuse <laughs> me for it now. Uh, no, I just put water in there. I just put water in there, but I do try and use Alpine water if I can. Mm -hmm. So I, I do want to talk about Shawgirl for just a second. That's a great relationship. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I. I was uh, a Yamaha artist for many, I think 25 years and, and had a wonderful relationship with them and, and uh, really enjoyed their horns. Um, and then uh, on one tour, the uh, the tour manager said, could we just go down and visit the Shargal factory? It's nearby. They were one of the sponsors of last night's concert. And I said, of course, you know, they're a sponsor. I'd, yeah, I'd love to. And uh, hey, a factory making instruments. I'm always up for having a look at that. It's great. We went to the Shargal factory and I tried some horns. And, um, you know, and talked to them and it was all lovely. But I tried this one horn. I kept going back to it. I said, can I just blow that one again? I went, mm, that's really, mm, that feels like me. And they said, well, would you like that horn? I said, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'll be a Yamaha artist and I, my horn's very good and I'm, I'm fine. Anyway, about two weeks later, I just kept thinking about this horn. I went, mm. Mm. so I contacted them. I said, can you send me that horn? And Carl Shargel. Uh, said, look, if you're serious about this, because he also deals with Yamaha, he's a dealer for them, funny enough, even though he has the Shargal factory. He said, I understand it's a big move if you are really serious about this, that you would have to switch to being a Shargal artist. So don't just try that horn. Come back and let's actually build a horn for you and see if this is really something you want to do. And they did, and it was. And, you know, I, had a, I, I said to the Yamaha people who I had a great relationship with, I said, at this stage of my career, to be with a small company that can custom make instruments is something I want to do because I want to try some stuff that obviously is not something Yamaha, you know, is, is set up to do or is involved mm -hmm. in, like, let's make a horn, you know, some of the weird horns I could call them. I've, you know, mm -hmm. can we make a hybrid that does this and put rotary valves on it? You know, I wanted to get into that stuff, and Shaga were very excited about doing that. So I made the switch. And um, and we're having an absolute ball, and they make wonderful instruments, of course. And all of my horns, saxophones, all the brass, everything are made by them. Even the drum kit my drummer plays is a brass drum kit made by Shargal. No kidding. Yeah, and it's a beautiful sounding kit too. You just don't want to carry it. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I I tried one of the Gonch horns at an ITG yep. conference. The valves were like the best valves. You know, it was the rotary. They were the smoothest, yeah. fastest. Yeah. Uh, and the articulation you get on a flugelhorn, particularly with the the rotary valves, I really like that. I mean, I have a rotary trumpet as well as my piston trumpet, but on the on the flugel now, I really just want to play the rotary flugel. It's just another type of articulation mm -hmm. that seems to suit that instrument. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a geek question for just a second. Mm -hmm. You know, going right. back and forth between trumpet mouthpiece, trombone mouthpiece. I mean, mm -hmm. for you, it's it doesn't matter. It's kind of like Maynard, right? Him, he would go back and forth between. Um, is it one of those things where it's just, you don't even think about it. You just, just do it. I don't think about it. I can say that, of course, I've analyzed it. And, uh, what it is, is that I don't have a trumpet embouchure or a trombone embouchure. People think I'm going between the two embouchures. Mm. Definitely the experience I'm having is not going between two embouchures, embouchures. I, rather than having a trumpet embouchure or a trombone embouchure, I have a flexible embouchure. It is one embouchure and it's mm. very flexible. That's how it feels. That's the experience I have. So I'm not switching, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. It's not a feeling of switching. It's just a feeling of going to another part in that flexible embouchure. That That's mind-blowing. I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> um, okay, John Foster, uh, we're going to wrap up here in, in just a second, but John Foster says, more specifically, Alan Zavod's trumpet concerto. <laughs> the conductor was a former trumpet player, and James was playing a C trumpet, and we all watched in amazement as James pulled a brand new horn out of the plastic on stage and sound amazing. Well, do you know what happened? He'd written this concerto, and it was the first trumpet concerto that had been written for me. And coming from a jazz world, 
I was unfamiliar with the C trumpet. I mean, I knew it existed, but I didn't have one and I didn't play one. And why would I? I had a B flat trumpet. I turned up in front of the symphony orchestra for the rehearsal to play this concerto, pulled out my trumpet, looked at the notes, listened to the music and went, this is wrong. And I thought, oh, this part's been written in concert. And I thought, ah, it's going to be hard transposing. I said, could I get a B flat part? And he looked at me and said, it's written for C trumpet. <laughs> I went, oh. So I called a friend at a music store and they sent one down right away. As he said, I pulled it out of the plastic <laughs> and went, that's a lot easier to play a C trumpet part on the C trumpet. Yeah. It's a I little weird for a while though, isn't it? I haven't seen you play piccolo trumpet. Do you play piccolo as well? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I love I love the sound of the piccolo. I was about to say I love playing the piccolo. This is not true. Does anyone love playing the piccolo? <laughs> I love the Do sound it makes. Yeah. But yeah. it's like blowing down a hose when someone's got their finger over the other end. Um, mm -hmm. When you're used to the trumpet, just, you know, the resistance in it. But I have a wonderful Chargal piccolo, which is by far, because um, the piccolos I've played really vary more than the B-flat trumpets. And I can do things on that piccolo I can't do on any other piccolo. And there's a piece that we did um, that I wrote for the uh, Abbey at Melk. Um, it's the largest abbey. It's where the Benedictine monks started and all that. But they had a big brass festival there. And I wrote this. It's called Stiftmelk is the place. That Stift is the German word for abbey. I wrote this piece called uh, Fanfare for Stiftmelk. And we did it with the international, uh, with the European Brass Ensemble. And I played the piccolo trumpet part. And Hans Gansch played a part. And Jens Lindemann played a solo part and uh, had three solo trumpets. Mm. And, um, yeah, the piccolo trumpet part on there goes up to double high Cs and all this stuff. And um, I did that on the Chargal, and it was great fun because it just sounds incredible, doesn't it, piccolo trumpet? Wow. It does. Uh, John says, James, tell Larry about Paul Panici oiling your piccolo valves. Uh, oh, oh. I had a piston piccolo. That one I've got now is rotary. We're doing this show live and it's being recorded. So it's a live recording, even worse. It's being streamed and. Oh, no. <laughs> well, obviously, uh, we lost him. We're going to hang here until he comes back. Um, I will say I'm, I'm thrilled to have everybody here tonight. Shane, Bruno, uh, John. Uh, let, me tr let me scroll back up here in these other, these other comments. Um, oh, look at that. I can click on comments and put them on there. That's a first. Sean, of course, uh, Klaus, uh, Andrew Davids, Josh Cohen, Eddie Davis. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here and listening to this. Um, yeah, so I'll take this opportunity to say if you haven't yet uh, subscribed to the Studio HFL newsletter, you can do that by going to studiohfl.com and subscribe there. You can also check out merchandise there, including the Studio HFL shirts. You can see one of the hats up on the shelf uh, behind me next to the Cancer Blow shirt. Uh, of course, there is this World Trumpet Force, the WTF shirt that's available. There are other colors also and styles available on the website. You can check that out. I uh, also say that this is an opportunity to say that Chris Coletti is going to be joining us this next Tuesday evening for another live interview. And that's going to be at 8 p.m. Of course, all of these interviews, May and June, uh, have all been sponsored by uh, Trent Austin and Austin Custom Brass. So you can find out more, of course, at austincustombrass.biz. Thank you, Trent, and your friends there. Looks like James is back. Let me put him on here. I'm back. I took the opportunity to, hang on a second, I'm trying to get you back on screen. I took the opportunity to do a little sponsor, uh, sponsor break there. So um, not all was lost. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. We're all good all right, again. The, the internet went off there for a sec. Um, now I was asked to say about Paul Panicki and the, and the piccolo trumpet. Yeah, this is... Much to my, uh, I don't know, chagrin, because uh, uh, it was all streamed, so people know about it. Um, I'm playing this piccolo trumpet. It was a piston trumpet, four valve. Oh, no. And I've been playing it for, I'd had it for about six months, maybe a little more, and played it on lots of gigs. And um, we we're on this gig with uh, five trumpets and a rhythm section. It was like a Bill Chase kind of thing, you know, a funky thing. And 
um, a project I called Scream Machine. Anyway, mm. I said to Paul, who was next to me, oh, I've left my piccolo trumpet in the dressing room. Can you grab that for the next song? I'll talk on the mic to the people while you get it. So I'm talking to about this next song. He comes out, passes me the piccolo. I play the piccolo in this next piece. And I'm screaming away. I'm like, wow. I'm thinking I'm having the best night on the piccolo. How good am like? <laughs> okay. Well. I guess this is supposed to be another sponsor break. Oh, he's back, he's back, he's back. All right, there we are. It's trying to stop me from telling That's the story. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. So. Have you got me? Yes. Okay. It's trying to stop. Obviously, the internet's trying to stop me from telling the story. I'll get it out. So <laughs> he brings a big out. I'm screaming away. I'm, I'm going great. And uh, after the gig... He says to me, oh, man, I, by the way, when I pulled your piccolo out, the vowels were a bit sticky, so I oiled them. Uh, last time you put it away, you obviously swapped some of the vowels around. I said, what? He said, yeah, the first valve and the third valve were round the wrong way. The first valve was in the third valve hole. And I went, that's impossible. I haven't taken the valves out for, you know, months. I've been playing it. So we swapped them. And funny enough, with this particular piccolo trumpet, because, you know, usually if you swap valves, you can't play the horn. Right. You could play it. It was just really hard. I'd been playing the thing since I got it new with the first valve and the third valve swapped when he put them around the right way. Uh, That's why I went, oh, wow, am I good on the piccolo tonight or what? <laughs> so I'd done gigs. I'd done recordings. I'd done the opening of the Olympics um, recording where I put some um, for this thing uh, on the piccolo trumpet with the valves in the wrong hole. I mean, talk about making it hard for yourself. Well, so, how is yeah. that even possible, right? I mean, you think about the, the physics of the horn. I mean, that's just... It was, a, it was a Yamaha four-valve piccolo, and this particular model, you can try it if you've got one, the holes are close enough where mm -hmm. it is on the first and the third valve that it will play. It's just difficult. I mean, yeah. it's really a lot of resistance, and the tuning's dodgy, of course. Um, but you can play it. And I just thought I'd never had a piccolo trumpet before I got this horn, took it out of the case, played it, and went, wow, these are hard. And I never looked. So wow. when he put them in the right way, I, I suddenly I was a much better piccolo player. So, uh, yeah, that was embarrassing because I could have kept quiet about it. But we went back on uh, for the next set. And I was so excited about it. I told the whole crowd, thinking I'm just telling these 200 people in this club. But, of course, it was online. So and everyone went. And, and I got messages of people going, wow, what an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what a great story. You know, yeah, and, and it's, it's you know what? Fact. It's not like the the trumpet's not a humbling instrument for a lot of us, anyways, right? I mean, it's just yeah. it's it's going to find a way to get to us. I, exactly. I do want to say, uh, you know, of course, uh, I met Bruno. I, I know almost everybody that's on the chat here, uh, but mm -hmm. John Foster has been at my house, been at my dinner table, and uh, he and Vince DiMartino were here. And uh, John is just a great guy, a great guest, and I hope you know I get to cross paths with with all of these guys, Bruno, Shane, uh, all these guys again. Um, James, this, this has been a real treat. Oh, thank I, you. It's great to chat to you. I, I've had a great time tonight. I do, I know you do so many interviews and there's so many, uh, so I feel very honored that, uh, you shared your time with me and, and my listeners tonight. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And, it's great to chat to you. And when your pop-up Academy makes it to Indianapolis, mm -hmm. uh, I will be there. I promise I will be there. Fantastic. I'll be yeah. in touch. I'll let you know. Yeah. So uh, let me uh, hang on for just a second. Let me say again, thanks to everybody for joining in this evening. And uh, of course, to Trent Austin and Austin Custom Brass for his sponsorship, their sponsorship of this interview. And uh, James, do you know Trent? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I do. I'm trying to think where it was we met. It was at a one of the, a trumpet gathering. Of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, and let's see. Oh, one more comment. Uh, Greg Hurst, very cool interview. Thanks, Greg, and everybody else, of course. Thank you for being here. Uh, next week, Chris Coletti, 8 p.m., and uh, be looking at social media this week for my July announcements on uh, who's going to be coming to uh, these live interviews. So thanks very much. We'll see you next week. Thank you again, James. Don't go anywhere. Uh, we'll wrap up after. See you, everybody. <laughs>